All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here. It's really cool to see talks um, like those given by the banks uh, because, uh, as many of you here know, my life currently uh, is heavily involved with open source. Um, but maybe sort of lesser known is that I was really only able to start getting involved uh, and learning to code because of open source. So um, as, a, as a quick sort of story leading into this talk, uh, I started to learn to code around 11 or 12 years old. And we had one uh, dial-up line. And I was not allowed to connect to the internet during the day because my dad needed that line. Um, so I really only had two ways to learn to code. And one way is super not open source at all. My dad would uh, drop me off at Borders Bookstore, which I think is now out of business. But, um, would drop me off at the bookstore. I would run to the corner where the computer books were. I would like crack open the book to not crease it because I couldn't afford to buy the books. I would I would crack it open, read and read and read, and I would read the same like five pages over and over because I had to memorize them because I couldn't take this book home. Um, and then I would run home and then try to sort of apply uh, what I learned, and I would repeat that sort of weekly. Uh, and then the other thing was when I discovered that open source existed. Um, and you know, GitHub doesn't G GitHub didn't exist. Uh, Google was relatively new, so I tried all these different search engines. But eventually, found out you know people uploaded tarballs and stuff of code. Um, and so I would download a bunch of tarballs at night, and then during the day when I couldn't uh, dial up, uh, I would just read the source code and learn sort of how to apply these abstract concepts. Books are really great at abstract concepts. Open source is really great at applying those concepts and showing me sort of how it could work. So that's how I really got started. And, and so it's very fitting, and, and I'm very happy that I'm able to sort of uh, build my career around open source software. Uh, and around eight years ago, I started a project uh, called Vagrant. And uh, as the bank said in the talk, it wasn't my first open source project. There was many before that that no one knows or cares about. Um, but Vagrant ended up being something a little bit more special, uh, became a lot more popular than I could have imagined. Uh, but also taught me a lot about you know, community, the non-coding side of open source. Um, I had to learn ab the, about the challenges of building a community, the challenges of bringing on contributors, uh, governance, those sorts of things. Um, and the success of Vagrant and, and getting into DevOps is also what led me to found uh, HashiCorp, which is uh, a company aimed at building, uh, striving to build you know, the best uh, infrastructure automation tools. And I, I uh, started this company with my best friend, uh, Armand. And together, uh, we've built seven free and open source licensed products that we've built uh, our company on, which uh, do development environments, uh, infrastructure automation, cluster scheduling, um, se security software. Uh, there's, there's a pretty wide array of things. And when we started HashiCorp, uh, we knew for sure we were building around four or five of these things, and we started that process. Um, and when we started, it was just the two of us. And when there's two of you, uh, and especially when you're as, as, as close as we were, uh, it's, it's easy. Like You have a mutual vision, a mutual understanding. You know how you want these things to work, how you want them to feel, um, and you can be really, really productive. Um, but we knew that to really you know, reach the goals and ambitions that we had for a company like HashiCorp, which is to make a much broader industry impact, uh, that it was going to be more than the two of us, and very likely much, much more than the two of us. So our biggest fear was how are we going to scale uh, our, not, not company vision, but product um, development and design vision. Like how are, how are we going to build an engineering uh, organization that really understands why we do some of the things the way we do some of the things we do. Um, not necessarily just what the problems are solving, but how we solve those problems. And so um, very early on in the company, um, and to most very surprisingly early, we wrote a document called the Tao of HashiCorp. Um, I think we wrote it when we were still around five employees. So it was really early. We published it about a year later. I think we published it in 2014. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure if that's right. Uh, but what the Tao is, is really sort of the principles that guide uh, sort of our vision, our roadmap, um, and product design of our products. And when 
you know, I've worked in companies where when I hear the word principles, I think it's some HR checklist um, that the company just has. Um, and with something like the Tau, I think it's, it's important to know that we wrote it when we were five people. It's important to know um, that we've applied it really rigorously sort of to our tools. Uh, and so what I want to do in this talk is go over the principles of the Tau, explain what they are, why they matter to us, and how we've applied them to our tools. And my, hoping with, my hope with that is that you could take this, and it's more broadly applicable to uh, not just building tools, but also a design decision in, uh, in when you're adopting tools. Like, is adopting this tool, um, is, is, are certain elements of the Tau important to you? And so an architecture uh, you know, issue with this tool uh, is not going to work for you. Um, and yes, so, so let's get started going through the Tau. There's eight of them. Um, a few of them are really similar, so they'll be very fast, uh, and some I'll spend more time on. Uh, so the first thing in the Tau is workflows, not technologies. Um, and it's not a mistake that we put this one first. It's really, really important to us. And so the idea behind this is that technologies, both software and hardware, um, continue to shift, like continuously will shift. If, if you expect that anything is going to remain constant, um, you're in for a rude surprise. And so with this idea, um, the, the core thing is that product design should start with an envisioned uh, workflow to solve a problem. Uh, and so I use a few words here. I, I say product design, and I'm probably going to say that a lot. Um, when we start a new tool, whether it's a new open source tool or a new internal sort of backend service, we don't start with directly with algorithms or architecture or things like that. We ask ourselves, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, and then we start designing. Um, and, and I use the word design uh, not in the, in the meaning of visual design, um, but actually uh, holistic design of how is it going to feel, but also how is it going to work. Um, and so uh, the examples I have here from our industry um, are sort of looking at you know, mainframe to server, server to VM, VM to container, or if you look at physical data centers to cloud, um, all these are huge paradigm shifts that have happened sort of over 10 to 15 year periods. Um, and in all of them, lots and lots of software was replaced. And uh, if you look, though, the core problems that people are trying to solve just didn't really change. And so the idea behind this is that most problems don't disappear. Some do, but most problems don't disappear. Some problems are created, of course. But there's a big group of problems which stay the same. And so if you, work, uh, if you aim at workflows first, you could often create software that could span multiple paradigm shifts. Uh, and that's really important to ease the adoption and transition into these different, uh, different stages. And so the, the best examples for our software here are Terraform and Vagrant. Um, Terraform is a tool for creating infrastructure. Um, with Terraform, you could create VMs, you could create um, physical servers, you could create containers, you could manage SaaS applications. And we have people uh, from hobbyists all the way up to um, you know, the world's largest on any given day company um, using Terraform to manage vastly different things, um, but using the exact same workflow. And so the last thing I'll say about this, again, it's really important, so spending a lot of time on this slide, but is, is this is how we also start our software. Um, Terraform and Vagrant actually both started as Bash scripts. And when I say that, people usually think I built like a minimum viable product in Bash. I didn't. I just put a bunch of echo statements and pretended something was happening uh, when nothing, it, di it did absolutely nothing. Um, but the reason I do that is I, is I write it in Bash, and then I use it for a day. I use it given it does nothing. Um, but I use it and try to see if it feels right. Like, is this how I actually want to work on a day-to-day -day basis? Because I'm going to commit to sort of like building something that I'm going to you know, work on and use for years. Is this how I want it to work? Um, and that's really the focus on workflows. Uh, the next thing, much simpler, much more obvious, I think, is, is the concept of simple, modular, composable. Uh, this could kind of be described as the Unix philosophy in a way, but I think that's uh, that the Unix philosophy is always interpreted to the speakers like you know uh, the most beneficial definition. So instead of saying that, um, the goal of this is really just to prefer smaller components with well-defined scope um, that are functional on their own, but can be integrated and composed with other tools to do new and interesting things. Um, and I think this is really obvious in our in, in our in the ethos of our company. We are sort of one of the few startup companies that 
built so many pieces of software that do vastly different things um, instead of bolting features onto different products. Um, Vault is a good example. Uh, we built Vault because people were putting secret information in console, which is a key value store, um, and we didn't feel console the console security story, it's, it's just not built for that. And so we felt sort of guilty in a way uh, that people were putting secret information in there, and we didn't have a better option to give them. Uh, we could have bolted on encryption to console, and certainly from a pragmatic standpoint, that is the way we started the design. Um, but as we started thinking through the, the turtle tower of security problems, um, you know, beginning with where does the key store it? How do you rotate the key? Um, who has access to the key? How is security bootstrapped? You know, as we went through these turtle problems, we realized that it would be a humongous problem uh, s solution to just bolt on to console and would be way out of scope for what that project was trying to do. Um, and so that's an example of uh, building Vault. The next thing is communicating sequential processes. So if you're building these modular components, just built on modular, um, they have to be able to communicate with each other. And for that, we just follow this model where all our software should be a standalone process that runs well on its own with a well-defined sort of communication interface um, and API uh, that, they use, that they use to uh, compose each other. I think that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the next thing is immutability. Um, and so immutability is, of course, the idea that things should not be able to be changed. Um, and the most popular um, and, and very appropriate for this conference uh, example is version control, right? Um, with things like Git, we, we get the uh, benefits of immutability, which is sort of the idea of atomic uh, you know, it's changeable with some surgery, but these atomic units um, that represent a version um, and, and a history behind that and who did, you know, a, a sort of blame trail. And these are only possible if you can't just change things whenever you want in the middle. Uh, and so mutability is really important to us because these concepts um, are really beneficial to other things. And a good example is infrastructure. If you consider sort of each stage of your infrastructure as an atomic unit that's driven uh, by a specific change, then you could see the history of your infrastructure. You could see who uh, impacted that history, when the change was created. Um, but you could also reason about desired states, uh, current state, and sort of how to get between them. If you know that what you should look like is exactly this and not this with these little changes, it's exactly this, and you're in this other worldview, you could transition to that. And that's really important uh, for infrastructures. Next thing, the next two are really the idea of codification. So codification is the idea of encoding knowledge as code. And so with infrastructure, historically, knowledge is passed on via oral tradition. Um, you join a company in their you know, sysadmin or IT or ops or whatever group. You look at the infrastructure and you ask, you know, why are things networked this way? Um, how does, you know, from, from a web user to this service, how does, how do, what, what applications that go through? Um, how do things work? And the most common response has historically been, oh, for that you should talk to this person and for this you should talk to that person because they're the subject matter experts on that. Um, and the problem with oral tradition is, is it's slow. Um, it's also just fickle because human memory is fickle. And so you don't quite get you know, the truth usually. Um, and so we ascribe very heavily to the idea that knowledge should be represented in code um, and use that as a source of truth. So with tools such as um, Vagrant, for example, how do you create your development environment? The answer before used to be read this humongously large readme uh, and follow this series of steps. And the answer today can be we have this code that is also executable. Like the document and description of what is your dev environment is also the configuration for the creation of that environment. And so that is uh, the second thing, which is automation through codification. Um, the idea that manual processes should be encoded as code and automated. Um, and this, in our industry, is just necessary. And I heard talks yesterday talking about just growing scale. Um, when you're this, this sort of scale of infrastructure growth and the scale of application change in a data center has, has already exceeded the point of human capability. Um, and so we need automation as a tool uh, 
to, to leverage ourselves to be able to manage that. And if, from the talks I saw yesterday, you know, if you imagine a world, if you believe in a world where there's only going to be you know, an order or more orders of magnitude, more devices, whether they're, uh, whether they're my refrigerator, or I really don't want my refrigerator to ever be connected to the internet, but whether it's my refrigerator or you know, a car or a watch or whatever it is, um, this is just going to put more and more burden and so we're going to need automation to be able to scale these processes properly. So automation uh, is absolutely critical. And the vehicle for automation that we choose is codification, um, which is different than simple scripting, which is a type of code. But uh, it's this idea that sort of the, the knowledge and processes is, is the same document that is automated. And the next thing is the idea of a resilient system. So we're deploying more and more things. Um, we're moving more and more to uh, cheaper, less reliable, whether it's hardware or just hard, uh, you know, infrastructure providers, um, and distributed systems, uh, smaller devices, things like that. And so in building this, systems have to be resilient. We're, it's not a matter of uh, you know, if there's going to be a failure. It's a matter of when. That's always been the case. But the when happens to just happen all the time. Uh, nowadays in large enough infrastructures. And so you have to consider resiliency. And there's various approaches to resiliency, uh, but the approach that we like to take is this desired state model. It's the idea that to build a resilient system, the system needs to be capable of understanding a desired state. It needs to be capable of determining its current state, and it needs to be capable of creating a plan or a path to get from its current state to the desired state. And if you consider that abstractly, that describes leader election systems. That describes um, infrastructure uh, configuration and desired state. That describes configuration management. Um, this is sort of how we build resilient systems. And if you could build this property into your software, um, the idea is that they all should strive and automate to being in the correct state all the time. Uh, and so you could see examples of this with Terraform, which is ter when you run Terraform, there's a plan subcommand. And when you run plan, what it actually does is inspects the current state, inspects your uh, desired state, and shows you what it would do to reach that. Um, because changing infrastructure is scary. So it shows you that before you could apply it. Um, with things like console, leader election, like I said, uh, could move to a desired state of having a server, uh, a leader. And then the last element of the Tau, which is really my favorite, but also the one that has actually been the most challenging for, for some people that have worked at our company. Um, we've actually had some people leave the company, which, which have left because we're just, we're just too pragmatic, um, but it is pragmatism. And pragmatism is the understanding that everything I said before uh, is a set of ideals. And they're ideals that we should aspire to and ideals that we should fight for and build into our tools. But if it's just simply not the right pragmatic solution, then we need to be able to be uh, you know, understanding enough uh, to reevaluate those ideals for the given problem set at hand. Um, and so uh, a good example of things like this is that not everything we do is immutable. Immutability introduces a number of challenges, and immutability is not always practical. And so the biggest uh, offender of this is console, is our KV store. Um, console doesn't actually have uh, versioning sort of built in, doesn't have this concept of immutable um, change sets. It has the idea of transactions and things like that, but, but it, to some people that's not enough. And so they'll reference our Tau and say, you know, you're, you're violating this principle that you had, um, which is fair, but at the same time it's, it's a practical, it was a pragmatic decision at the time, um, and we've certainly, you know, got built features around that more and more as time has gone on. Uh, so pragmatism is absolutely important uh, when building these, uh, building against uh, ideals. And so that is really the Tau of HashiCorp. And, and I hope that if you've used our software, um, you could see it every day in, in what you're using. Um, all the tech leads of our projects, all the engineers of our projects um, continually sort of apply this on a, on a uh, RFC by RFC basis when new features are being developed. Um, but this is also the principles that we use when evaluating software that we don't write. When there's five different choices out there, we tend to choose the choices that align closest to our ideals. And by having them written down and having them clear, uh, you know, our opinion isn't, isn't changing and isn't, uh, isn't just what's best for the moment. It's actually really 
clear uh, of what we care about and what we're looking for. Um, so I hope this helps. Thank you.